Hello, welcome to the All or Not podcast. Our official sponsors are KR Couriers and Transport Limited. This is a North West based courier company delivering all across the UK. They can assist in home moves and removals to large, heavy and bulky items, collections and drop-offs. Fast, safe and reliable deliveries. Please get in touch for a free quote. You'll find all the information within the description. Thank you. Hello everybody and welcome back to the All or Not podcast with myself, Billy Moore, and today's special guest is Barry David Hulse. Barry, thanks yes. for coming on. Welcome. Cheers, Barry, Barry has got a really interesting story, one of perseverance and resilience. So I'm interested today, you know, the journey you've been on because you spent 10 years almost yes, in yes. a prison in Mumbai, India. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself before we go into this story. So your background, what's your name, where you're from, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, my name's Barry Ulster, as you just mentioned. Um, everyone calls me Baz. I'm well known as Baz around my area. Um, like I say, basically, just a, an every normal life. Went through school. Uh, I had my, my son at 17, my one and only son. Uh, I was 17 years old. Um, went into work, sort of 10 years Worked up to manager in a factory, stuff like that. Um, and then sort of from there, again, managerial work in Marks and Spencers and whatnot. I was in a glazing firm, sort of 2009. Uh, and that's when my journey started, let's call it. So so you're the same age as me, so we're getting on. Yeah, I was fifth a couple of days ago, actually, mate. Happy birthday. Thank nice. you very much. Born 1973. Yes, certainly yeah, was. Time yeah. was too. <laughs> But yeah, so your journey started to take a different path in 2009. Yeah, so um, basically I travelled to Goa a lot. The previous 10 years, I loved the country. Uh, it was nice and cheap. I loved the, the prices as well. Um, and so basically I've been over and myself and my me, me late mother, we purchased um, an apartment off plan uh, around 2005-06. Uh, and that was being built over four years. So over the following four years, I went with a couple of different friends and had been with different girlfriends, family members, etc. Uh, just to see the progress, basically. Uh, around 2006, it was. Uh, I'd been over with a friend. I won't go too much in because he might not buy the book. But basically, I got set up by a so-called friend. Uh, unbeknownst to me, the following three years, I'd returned to India, to Goa. And um, basically, I had no idea that my name was on a lookout circular within Indi Indian airports. Uh, I got arrested 2009 and so on and so forth from there. Yeah, so tell us what happened with the story. Because it was like you got a 20 year sentence in India for diazepam tablets. Yes, correct. Uh, yeah. Thousands, yes. over 7,500 tablets. Yeah, 7,500 strips, which was actually of 10, so it's 75,100 it was total when I found the total amount. Yeah. So, but that took a, quite a while. Um, Asian countries, as you know yourself, they're very slow, the judicial process yeah, and the way slow, things yeah. the way things work. Uh, so I was actually under trial in a Mumbai jail called Arthur Road for three years, eight months, um, while the trial was running. I mean, you get a court date every two weeks and then there'd be no guards or no judge or prosecution, whatever. Your trial might run or not. Uh, I was actually quite lucky. It only took three years, eight months, and I expected to be acquitted as everyone else did. Uh, unfortunately, they give me, well, I thought it was a 10 year sentence mm. at first because obviously you, you get hit with a sentence and your mind's fuzzy. The next morning, uh, we've got the newspaper, the, you get an in English print newspaper actually within the prison and it was British man gets 20 years. So basically what the judge had said was you get 10 years, but not to run consecutive. It was it's concurrent rather, just consecutive. So you do 10 and you do yeah. another 10. So we give you 20 to do. It certainly did. And people with heroin were getting tens and things, you know, so it was quite... And you got ar arrested and charged with diazepam that you had by the local chemist? Correct, yes. And he gave you that fucking sentence? They certainly did. Apparently, if you if you have a medicinal license, you can export these, these goods. Unfortunately, my details were took by this so-called friend 
who was set up by and there was uh, like i said the actual evidence within the court over them three years eight months with different witnesses they had nothing they had no cct evidence um they had a photocopy of my passport obviously what he'd obtained but there was a lot of misinformation within the uh, evidence and uh, personally i don't think i ever should have been sentenced yeah so what was actually going on with these tablets where were they going what was you doing with them uh, well basically like i say i we'd, we'd gone shopping um i tell you all in the book it's an and in the market there it's quite so this uh, is the book no tension that's that's the one you can yes. get this on amazon i had a little look at this last night yeah quite interesting brilliant thank looking you, forward mate. to reading it thank you very much uh yeah so um like i say we'd we'd gone over in 2006 and i bought a load of uh, the year before actually I'd bought some um, big items like a Buddha and yeah. it was like an elephant and it was quite heavy goods and I went to the airport and they said because it's over they charged me like £300 or something and I wanted these articles so obviously the following time I was going to post all my you know about t-shirts and different things for the family Garnier creams for myself and stuff and uh, like I said uh, packaged them up ready to come home with me in the luggage he was there a couple of days actually with his girlfriend he said leave him with me i'll post it post them for you he took all my details i give him the money to post them then we returned back to england uh, obviously within a couple of weeks the package packages hadn't arrived uh, then he was asking me where's the packages well i said well they've not arrived and then it sort of rung a bell with me you know what's what's in these packages red flags here yeah. Yeah, yeah of course a few red flags long story short he disappeared off the scene uh, I went back to go, uh, to Goa in the March. This happened in the November, December, two thousand five, six. I went back in the March, and I stayed in the same hotel. And the receptionist actually gave me a letter from the customs branch in Mumbai, saying, "You know, they've misdeclared goods. There's actually diazepam inside the boxes." Now, obviously, at that time, I didn't know the quantity, and it said if you want to collect them come to Mumbai, but I mean, Mumbai from Goa is a two and a half hour flight on its own. Um, so I ripped up the paper. I thought I've lost, you know, I've lost me goods. Mm. I don't want the diazepam anyway. I've lost me other goods. I'd maybe spent 80 pound. I'm not going to go all the way to, and I just forgot about it. Like I said, gone back over to check on the uh, progression of the apartment, myself and my mum and stuff, and I oh, with a different girlfriend at the time, and there was no problem. 2009 I went on my own I think then in immigration then the red flags come for them and he's looked at the screen the officer he's looked at me looked at the screen two or three times wait there and I still didn't think anything of it until he said you know you have to wait here Mumbai customs are going to come in and take it from there wow so what was it like the experience in a in a, in a prison in Mumbai well I mean obviously it was just what were the conditions like because i can you know i can, I can relate to the can yeah of course you I can, can relate to I the, mean, the conditions were just like In third world i mean yeah. obviously it's third world country but it's like going back 100 years yeah and you never experienced that type of thing we've gone into this um this this building if you like uh, the open ground it's like a barrack structure and the british obviously ruled india back in the day in the raj um and they the actual British Army built these structures to, for the Indian prisoners. And it, they basically, like I said, they're rectangular structures. They're made for 80 men, each floor, a ground and a first floor. But there's 200 to 220 men in every time. Uh, you get your, your, a bistrot and durry, it's called, basically. It's like a mat, two foot by six foot. That's your position on the floor. There's no, there's no foot room, you know, you're climbing over people. You have your ceiling fans, like, you know, you have your washing lines up with T-shirts and shorts and whatnot everywhere, and you'd have your plastic bag behind you on a, in a nail on the wall or whatever else. Yeah. Uh, there's six toilets for all them men and only three at work. And, you know, the smells, and they can't be described, the actual smells and the sights, as you probably know yourself. Yeah. They can't be described, but the conditions, like I say, at night, they'd be bed bugs, you'd have to burn them in the wall and... And the, the noise, you just can't get away from the noise. It is just, it can send, you know, the sanest of men crazy. So after sort of two months of bearing that, obviously getting used to eating rice for breakfast, lunch and dinner, um, and 
The staples there to Southeast Asia. <laughs> of course, but it's like third class. It's not your basmata. Yeah. Really, it's like the lowest of the low rice. You've got to tear it. Yeah, yeah, we had the sticky rice. So it was like... Oh, yeah, you put your, you put your things up on the wall. It can be 20 it, yeah. key, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then there'd be charcoal in when you're chewing away as well. You're enjoying it and you crunch something in your teeth, you know. So, like I say, the, the food was absolutely disgusting. I had yeah. to sort of get used to the water conditions. Now, obviously, there's water problems in India. You'd all have to bathe round a well. Uh, the poorer people couldn't have a bucket and there'd be fights every morning, everyone hitting each other with the metal pots and fighting over a bit of water. But um, like I say, it's just to get that minute's peace. I just couldn't cope with it. Um, I was nearly sort of beating people up all the time and the su- superintendent put me in another area. Fortunately, by May, um, like in 2010, this building was falling down. I mean, they'd been up a couple of hundred years. So there was someone there at the time called Ajmal Kassab, and he was the uh, lone surviving terrorist. They'd done an attack from Pakistan 2008 on Taj Mahal and everything else. There's a lot of films about it out there. So he was a lone surviving terrorist in my jail. And it was co- it's called Andabarat, which is, means in Hindi, a jail within a jail, mm. basically, uh, for security. Now, they built a bomb-proof barrack for this you know, for this man. And uh, once he moved out, I got put in there. So that's where I met all these sort of characters that you'll read about in the book, you know. What kind of characters did you come across? Because I know I remember meeting uh, like a funny character in a, I was in a shell. Yeah. Called a Hong. Yes. 87, which is the room, the room that's what they call it. So it was Hong 87. And um, it was the crazy room. Right, yeah. that was the. It right. was fucking labelled the crazy room. Yeah, and I said, yeah. I wanted to go into a smaller shell from forty inmates into something with ten. Got you. And that was one. There was nine inmates in there, and there was one room available, one one space. And he said, hey, Billy, avoid that fucking shell like the plague. Right. Like, they're all nuts <laughs> in there. And I was thinking, you're all fucking nuts. You know, I want to go in there. Yeah. I remember there going in there, and it was a diverse group of Nigerians, Tanzanians. Yeah. There was yeah. a few Indians. There was a few Malaysians. There was a lot of different uh, characters. There was an Indian guy there called Sunil. Yeah. Sunil Khan, right? He was fucking around the bend, like totally lost the plot. He'd been nicked for murder. He hadn't done it. It was a funny story. He'd met some bird. It fell in love. Some side bird. It fell in love. The other threesome, she got jealous and killed a bird. Right. He was in the room. So he <laughs> come on, soft for him. Yeah. He, up, he got seven years for that, right? Because they don't value life in Thailand. As no, much as they no do of course, him. yeah. So, yeah, and he was um, he was fucking, he was a proper fucking sex fiend. He wanted to shag the pigs down the fucking pig really? farm. And wow. Valentine's Day was coming up and he'd be doing it. And he would do the jiggy jiggy. Yeah. And he was like, oh, there's they God. The, the, the fights in that cell was fucking bizarre. Yeah, and yeah. And I'm picturing the propeller fan. Yes, and the black books, the little books, yeah. my new things that you know would be you'd be itching, like yeah. there was no tomorrow, and and the mosquitoes, the ants, the, the, ants, ants, oh, the red, red ants, the you, black ants, yeah. you couldn't even put your fucking food down, and no. you'd, it'd be swamped. Two minutes, correct? Yeah, mate. Yeah. It must be swamped. Yeah. With, so yeah, it, it, it's similar. You know, we can identify with that. So some of the characters you met. Yeah, like yeah. I said, the first guy I was padded up with. Um, the under barracks a structure where this sort of it's one to four. Um, so there's four areas, uh, a tower within the middle of it. It's not a big area, but they've uh, number two and number three have got nine cells. Number one, number four have got six. And it's obviously because it's on a circular structure, it sort of tapers. It's thinner sort of at the bottom, widens yeah. at the bo- uh, back. It's made for a maximum of three men, one or three. They don't have two for some reason because of fighting or whatever else. Yeah. Um, and basically... That was 24 hour running water, so I really wanted to go in there because water twice a day was so you realize how water is such a massive commodity, you know, how much yeah. it's, you know, you need it. So that was that was a clincher for me, the 24 hour running water, you know. But like I said, when I got in there, the first guy I was in a cell with had hijacked a plane to Kandahar in Pakistan and he was away with the fairies and some Muslim guy. And then, like I say, over that sort of the next following two and a half years, I was in there. I met, uh, I come close to a really good friend of mine, sort of a big gangster from the 90s who got extradited over from Thailand to face charges. Um, basically everyone within there, there was Bollywood people a couple of times, a couple of Bollywood stars come in, friends with them. And so there's like a few different people, you know, like I said, met loads of Nigerians, these yeah. Somalian pirates, was under one of them in at one point. And, 
some diamond thieves from Mexico and so I met quite a few it's a few good 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 friends though as well. Made the world friends. the world is full of fucking a ragtag. Yeah. It's a ragtag place of fucking villains in it that it certainly is spread across the globe it certainly is and but you'll you'll meet uh, you know people from every race religion creed and it'll just be it'll just be a massive culture shock yeah and i think that's for myself i don't know about you but it kind of kept me fucking alive you know the, the humor yeah right it's yeah you know there were times where it was quite fun you know yeah. a, a good time you know amongst a bad time of course yeah yeah because it was you know, I think you, you like Michelle, but from the north of of the UK, and and it's it's within us to kind of survive in a sense of like I mean it is probably with it with it within everyone, but survive on your humour, to survive on fucking just like struggle with a smile. Yeah, well that's it. When when you don't know the language as well, you've got to learn from body language. You know, it's not the it's not the vocal because I didn't have a clue what they were saying. You know, for a good couple of years, so I started picking up bits of hinder and yourself. You wouldn't you wouldn't know a few so what cap or something yeah. or you know different Thai words, but to actually understand them and there was some scary situations. Like I say, once I got sentenced after the twenty, I went to two different jails as well, toward further south towards go at a place called Puna, which is another quite a big city, and a place called Kolapur, which is sort of small village area but um yeah so i sort of uh, I, I visited three of the jails if you like so there's not much difference in them all no it's the same i mean no. the silence is the same just that like chiang mai the first one i went to was small compared to klong prem in, in bangkok but like the same it was um it'd say small it had four thousand inmates in chiang mai yeah right and it had like what twenty thousand in Klong Prem because it was three prisons within a complex. Yeah. You know, yes. you've got a drug prison, you've got a women's prison, you've got a hospital, you've Course, got yeah. you know, you've got your whole bombard, which is it's just a lot. Um and then you've got, you know, the big tiger, which is the Hilton. Yeah. Not far. The Bangkok Hilton. Yeah, the yeah. Bangkok Hilton. So you've got Lad Yao, Klong Prem, Bombard, the women's prison, the hospital. And all this was in a massive complex. That's we, all in the one, yeah. We had a thousand inmates just on our complex alone. So like the the cold tens. Right yeah. then, 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 then Hog, then Song, then Sam. These are the the, the, the names of the, the compounds, and they were like barracks. Yeah, it says off into trees, you know, with two floors, you know, and it's a shell. Some of them had forty inmates in them. Some of them had ten. You know what I mean? That's how they, they operated. But yeah, fucking hell, you know, you will come across a lot of people. So did you have did you have any um, you know facing reality? Because it was difficult for me. Did you get addicted to any substances while you were in there, or was you was you already in the grip of anything, or was you using something? No, I mean um, I party back in the day and stuff. Um, I like to you know smoke a bit of weed and stuff like that. So to get a bit of that in now and again, you might you know have a have a blast of that. I got offered a lot of this brown sugar and everything else, but I wouldn't touch it because I know what, what it was. Does the to weed like, what was the weed like? It's ganja. It's full of seeds, but it'd yeah. be a ritual. You'd all sit down, cross-legged, round your mat, you know, in someone's cell or one of the gangster boys, basically, because yeah. no one else could get away with it. And you'd sit down, cross-legged, and it'd be like, you know, a tea party. You'd, you'd take the seeds out and they'd roll, rub it in the f hand, in the palm, and they'd de-seed it again, and they put it in a chillum. Um, for people that don't know what a chillum is, it's like a long clay pipe. So you could make them in the jail, you know, yeah. scrape them out. And then you do your mix with a cigarette, they'd fill it up, they'd light and pff, 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 and away you go. So get stones of off it. Oh yeah, it get a bit of a hit. Yeah, it, yeah. it, it helped pass the, you know, certain days and whatnot. So it was, it was all right sort of thing. But it was very, very hard to get, you know, this was sort of the last, the last year. Once you're convicted, as you, you'll know yourself, there's no one going out the building. There's no one bringing stuff from oh, court. Right. So fucking tell me about it because when I'm in um, Chiang Mai you know there's little bits coming in you know but there was nothing there it was all medication yeah. it was all diazepam right it was uh, tramadol it was the kind of like fucking nitrazepam it was them you know there was, there was a lot of different kind of like um, antidepressants and sleepers and, and downers yeah, you know yeah. and painkillers but there was never you know any tie stick they get out there, there don't was, they? See, I, I, I got nicked, right? And I had a bar announcer tie stick on me when I got nicked. Plugs all in clingy, 
Yeah. Yeah. I had my spears always. Why the fuck <laughs> he had a pair of spears always on? I don't know, but I was glad I did. Yeah, yeah. Because for some reason, they don't strip you. They don't strip search you in no. the police station. Right. Right, they nicked you, boom, in the plot shop. I ain't fucking cuffed to this busy. Right. I'm saying, like, I need to go to loop. He's going, oh, I want hung nam, hung nam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got these, like, fucking six or seven little balls down my fucking spears and I've got to, I've got to get them. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So he's let me in a solo, but he's chained like that, and I'm like, plug, 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 plopping these in. Like there's no way I've had that So it gets, it <laughs> yeah. gets into <clears throat> into the fucking side prison, and it, it's just awkward to smoke. Yeah, yeah. You know because it stinks. It's so yeah. you know Putin, Pyong Pyong. Well, as you know yourself, money talks in them countries. Yeah. If you've got money, you can live like a king, or yeah. you know a king. You know to a certain extent within the jail, you'll get your little luxuries. Uh, when I was staying with, like, say, Santos Shetty, the the big gangster. Uh, we was getting everything in, mate. We was having eggs for breakfast. We was having, you know, I got a bit of McDonald's one day. It was like, wow. Yeah. You know, and what, what does me in, what really pisses me off is when you watch this, you know, I'm a celebrity or whatever else it is, big boy, wherever they go. Yeah. Love Island, and they don't have a scram for a couple of days. Oh, I'm dying for a, you know, but dying for a burger. I'm dying. You try it for a good couple of years, you know, see what it tastes like then. I mean, so I got a Mackey's once, yeah. right? And it was New Year's Day or Christmas Day. It was one of them. It was a fucking day. It was in Bangkok. And uh, the embassy came up. Kate. You know, she was Australian. It was weird. We had an Australian yeah. fucking bird as a fucking British embassy, fucking consulate, yeah. whatever. And she brought like a fucking load of Mackie burgers in. Yeah. You know what I mean? Big Macs, the lot. Right. They were fucking freezing. Right, but they were fucking gorgeous. You know yeah, what I mean? yeah. And we had them on um, the little visit that she, she, we had at the time. That was the only time... You know, we would, um, and like you said, if you meet the right people, you get the right things. That's it, and it, it, it helps pass the time a bit mm. better, you know, these little things. But I've always said is, you know, you look around you, and what sort of made me get through it, obviously, is all the love and what I got from the family and friends, you know. I've just got so much help behind it, you know. And when on my darkest days, I'd look, and obviously, you you got to wash your ass over there, you know. There's no toilet roll in no, no. that heat. Fucking hell. So, I mean, there was guys with no arms, you know. They can't even wash their own ass, you know. So, I'm lucky. I'm lucky, mate. So, you've always got to turn that negative into a positive, you know. And I got kicked in the balls that many times. Like I had, you know, four tonsils. But at the end of the day, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. You've got to keep striving and striving. And every, I'd say before I went, I could never do that. But, you know, yourself, human resolve, mate. Yeah. And especially like yourself, like, like us, if you sort of know the streets and it's in you. And you, you've got that survival. You know, that's yeah, it. You've got that fighting instinct with yeah. you. I um, you know totally identify with the um, the fucking wiping your ass with no bog roll and yeah, yeah. having a hole in the ground and using. But a do you bog. know a funny story they used to tell me is it is more hygienic when you look at it because yeah. what they say is you know you 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 do a shit you rub it on the arm there where there's a load of air and you wipe it with toilet roll. What you're gonna get left? It's not gonna be clean, is it? No. You know. So I did f actually find it hygienic, but. You pour it out in this country, it'll fucking freeze before you have your ass on it in the water. Yeah, it so. was just, I, I, I'm sure there was a fucking, like, a proper, like, way to do it. I just never had a fucking clue. And I was thinking, these are boss, they like the way they flap the water. <laughs> right? I'm trying to fucking scoop it, and yeah. then I'm rubbing it. And then you've got your fucking finger on a load that's yeah. like, oh, mate. Well, we were lucky, we got a jug, you could buy jugs off someone, do you know what I mean? Like a type of... Uh, a big, you know, like, uh, say, a garden yeah. watering can or something yeah. like that. So, but you'd always have to take um, the soap with your left hand. Yeah. But I used to think, what if you're fucking left-handed? You're holding it with your right and washing your ass with your left. It was, it was, so. the oddest, it was the oddest thing. I found it really fucking difficult, especially when I first landed, you know what I mean? In the end, you just fucking got to do it. Of course, mate, just, yeah. Just, Can just, I ask you a question, if you don't, on, mind? you don't mind? Please, How long did it take you to sort of adjust, would you say, to their conditions, their lifestyle, and sort of get your head round things? I'd say it really about a good year. Yeah, I agree. Totally That's spot on. A good year for me, because yes. it, I was still, like, fighting that hope that, you know, this can't fucking be real. You know, um, did you also think I'm British? Yeah, get I was, me out. Yeah, I was we're rebellious. powerful. Yeah, I was rebellious as well, uh, and I was very resistant to to change. Yeah, and you know, and I was always trying to like bend the rules. And yeah, and it yeah, was just so, yeah. it's, it's, total acceptance was like about a year in. You're like, fuck it, lad, just fucking just lived like these, live, yeah, yeah, and survive. You will, that's right? It. And that's what I did. I had to live the way they lived, and. Um, 
like you said, you know, it took about a year plus, and then I started the having fried eggs for breakfast. You're right. You know, and I was having, you know, fish and and, and rice that yeah. was cooked. You got fish as well. Yeah, we had the catfish. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Don't don't think don't, don't no, think no. we had sea bass. No, no, we had like a lake, right? It was a, right. It was a lake, man. It was a lake within the prison. Really? Like a big massive pond, should I say? And the sides would just dive in, you know, with the fucking bills on, <laughs> and uh, they would come up wrestling with these. Yeah, big, yeah. Ugly fucking the catfish. Yeah, the yeah. Like yeah. get them, smash them over the head with a bat, right? Stays away, be fucking heads and tails and fins and all that coming up, right? And then they'd throw them in a fucking stuff. Like, yeah, like, they were yeah. horrible. They were, they would taste yeah. horrible, right? They were like pure mudfish. Yeah, it's each shit and everything, big turds. Well, it's but it's the meat, though, isn't it? You yeah. know what I mean? We, we used to get sort of chicken three times a year, Christmas, one Muslim festival, one Hindu. Yeah. You had to pay for it, but I'll tell you what, they used to cook it, they used to keep it for like two weeks and just keep recooking it, you know, it's like... Well, it, it's, see, we had the, the thingies, the the, 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 the the Africans had the food on the Monopoly, you know, they, they, were, the, they were running, like, the right. dishing out of the foreigners' food, right, and they'd rob all the chicken. Right, right. So right. You, you'd go, right, seriously, lad, you'd go with your little fucking metal bowl. Yes. You'd wait in this mad, long fucking queue <laughs> fighting wrestling with yeah, people. yeah. To get these and they'll be sploshing, splosh, splosh. And then you just hear these fucking, these Nigerians going, get away, get away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd be like, well, yeah, yeah, be fucking out. Splash. Like, there's no chicken in that, you know, there's fucking no, in no. that, you know, there's nothing in it. Get away. Yeah. And yeah. Then, because what they do, lad, right, is yeah, the, 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 they'd sell the chicken to the ties, right? The ties would cook it again, yeah. right? And then sell it on. I like, saw so you were you were just getting it was just a fucking nightmare to get fed. Yeah. I nearly had fights with them all the time because there was that many of them, right? They'd be running yeah, next to yeah. these fucking like food trolleys, like it was the UN food fucking yeah, like parcel. You know what I mean? And they'd be dancing with it, and they wouldn't let you go near it's it. A, it must be a Nigerian thing. It was the same with the food over there. Well, I mean, they same had, with they, the food. They, they had it with the drugs. They had it with the drugs. Yeah, like the tablets. They had it with the food. But they're switched on now. They yeah. like us, aren't they? Yeah, they're they switched like on, mate. Very, the very grafters, smart, very smart. they've got fuck all. No, that's right. it. So the graft, lad, they, yeah. and they, they had no fucking embassy to to speak of that would look after them. No, you know, and they, they were they were selling. They, I was buying. I was getting drugs. Right, this is how I'd operate. I'd get me drugs off this English doctor. Right, once a month you come and see you, they prescribe you for a month. Nice trazzy pan, fucking all the fucking all the, the, the tamazis and all, yeah, all yeah. The, the the good stuff that they liked, and that shell. Like my whole month's prescription to an Nigerian guy for for like two thousand baht. Yeah, yeah. And then I'd use that. I'd use that in a day. What was it then? That two felt about forty quid. Was yeah, it? Yeah, we probably did. I, I couldn't it even was, think. Fucking. Yeah, you know, really shame, you know. We was you, the currency over there, right? Was stamps. Right. King's Head. That was yeah. That was worth money. Yeah. It was fucking bizarre. Yeah, you but can't, yeah. You can't uh, slag the for Thai King though, do you? Didn't no, want that. no. Kill you won't know if you slug him. Yeah, he was. He was. The he was a really good. It, the the one, the one like that was before the one now. He yeah, was quite, the previous, he, he, was, yeah. he was really like liked, very popular. Yeah, he was. Yeah. The one now he's a bit of a slag. Yeah, I, I was believe. over there one year and. Uh, it was in, in the pit, you know, watching the cinema, having a quiet night, and then the king comes on before everything, don't you? They all stood up, we yeah. sat down, and all, oh, the half attack goes, ah, oh, you stand up. Like, okay. oh, lad, you've got to stand up and yeah, fucking yeah. sell a national anthem That's in the cinema. It, yeah. That was the yeah. maddest one. Yeah, yeah. I always say it goes in my head, because yeah. I used to get up in the morning, and I'd have to stand there, watch this flag, it was like a prisoner of war camp. Right, and you'd have to stand there and just like sing the national anthem. I didn't have to fucking wait at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was fucking mad. But yeah, the, the experiences that we've both had are similar. Yeah, how better. did you survive? Because I know I'm, I'm pretty sure I know how you did. We've just got to keep breathing. Of course, you know? of course, and just like thank your lucky stars and hope and pray that one day you will definitely get out. You know, and to be honest, uh, I thought it was hard off for my family going through it it's, yeah. as you probably know yourself from your own family members it's like the grieve you while you're away you know it's like is he ever going to come home and it's like it's like you've actually passed because it's sort of in limbo you can't nip over to spain every you know if it's in spain rather you can nip over every few weeks but yeah. india is like a 12 you know 11 12 hour flight a lot yeah. of money you'd only sometimes the family come over i didn't even get a a visit you know, or it was a through a college alley screen, you know, like a meet at a part and they're yeah. all screaming and 
in different languages, so you don't really see them. That's the worst thing. Yeah. You can't hug them. Yeah. You know, my lad come over a few months after. He was he was 18 at the time. He just got arrested and that. And it just broke me, you know. My mum and my son were there on the other side of the screen. I just wanted to hug him. And you just can't, you know, because the guards didn't turn up to take me to the court like they should. So mm. it's just, you know. It was like, for me, I had, like, no visits from my family because my mother, you know, my father and my... But they just could not, you know, possibly finance a trip. Yeah. To Thailand to come and see me for however long, you know what I mean? Um, and I didn't want them to at the time. There was a few friends that travelled over who were just on trips that, you know, made an effort and come and see me, you know, and they were buying me bits and that. Yeah, yeah. Bits of food. It was all about the food, and it? Course, it's all yeah, about yeah, the fruit, definitely. it's all about the bread. Oh, that, them chocolate bars that I used yeah. to get, they used to get one piece, used to get done in every night after me, you know, mm. a little special treat. But I can yeah. imagine that the Indian foods would be a lot better than... Oh, mate, mate, honest to God. You know dal, it's like yeah. uh, a lentil. Yeah. But you don't, like you said, you don't know dal in it, so it's just dirty water. But you can't, there was a canteen, so basically you can get like, it's called fasan, it's like a savoury snack, so you can mix that with it. A bit of murchy powder spice, you know what I mean? And and depending what jail you was in or what, what area, you could, it, it's called handy, you can cook the food. So obviously yeah. you had the tin plate. So you'd make little stands with um, the clay, you get a load of paper or the dry rota, what they did all the old rotas, and yeah. you used to burn whatever you could get older basically, and you used to get your food warm, sort of seven at night, you know, if you when you wanted to eat. So that was okay sometimes, at least you could have hot food. Otherwise, you're eating your food at four, you know, and then you bang up sort of half five uh, till next day. It's fucking odd, isn't it, when you wake up and you're having curry for breakfast? No, it is. Yeah, it is. Mate, it but uh, to be honest, it, the breakfast was, uh, it's called Powa, which is a rice again, but you'd have a cup. It's like a yellow rice. I don't know what the difference is. To be fair, <laughs> but probably got piss in it, lad. Definitely, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't know, but uh, I like to say it'd be that. That's basically you get that all the time, and then on a Sunday you get a badger, which is uh, you get their fucking vegetable, which was mm -hmm. lady's finger was one of them. Um, you know that old crud, and but these are crap. It's all hanging, and the way they cook it, you can imagine. I think the worst meal that we ever had in here was something called Chiang Mai noodles, and it fucking <laughs> dunk lads. Some of the size loved it though, it was weird. Yeah, yeah. Mate, that was the, I used to hate that fucking day. You knew, you know, wake up in the morning. Yeah, what's, set what's, day, set, yeah, set what, food, innit? What's, yeah. what's for fucking dinner? One of this, this English fella calls you, yeah, I go, wow, oh, it's fucking Chiang Mai noodles today, bro. <laughs> yeah. Chiang Mai noodles, mate. I'd be mean, like, fucking hell, that means I'm on the graft. Yeah, right? yeah. And um, yeah, that was what it was about. So, did you ever come across any violence fucking violence uh, or really fucking horrible like I say there, there was there was a lot of scuffles here and there but there was nothing to fight over you had one TV channel on a black and white teller or you know a 19 inch black and white teller at the end of the barrack um, the lot of, lot of fights were about space now there's a lot of people in there because someone stole a coconut off someone's tree you know they're not educated people yeah. these people never <coughs> seen a white man they'd be I'd be, I'd be sat there in the first few weeks some couldn't be touching me tattoo you know me I'm like, what are you doing and they, they just oh, so sort of, idea, yeah. they just they've not seen it they've not seen white people they've not seen like a beach they've, all they've grown up is you know there and they try a little village or something that's they, they're just surviving basically to eat food and uh so you get all types of characters like i say coming in and it was a, obviously a real eye opener you know seeing all these so madness so no murders no rapes no uh, well, they actually had a barrack, so our barrack uh, was NDPS, which stands for Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substance, which is mine. So it's all club does one. And what they do is they have a commercial quantity. So uh, they call it charas, so you, you're black, you know, you, you like your, your weed, your draw, whatever yeah. else you call it. So they, they call it charas. Now you're allowed up to one key of that, and then you get anything over the keys, a minimum of 10 years anything under a kilo is a maximum of 10 yeah my weight was 751 gram and it's diazepam so i'm thinking that's not as bad as chadas you know so but basically it's a 500 gram commercial quantity on the diazepam which makes me get a minimum of 10 you see otherwise a lot what you find is because he spent so much time under trial when it comes to the uh, sentencing it, they might only carry a seven-year sentence. They've already done five, so the, the judge will acquit them anyway, sort of thing. So, um, well, um, like I say, there's a murder barrack. 
um, just for murderers. Um, but again, there's a lot of them, they've killed the wives because it's arranged marriage and they're not happy and everything else. And they, there's some proper characters, real characters. But as for the violence, um, there was a gun found, there was a gun went off, someone shot at <coughs> someone. That was uh, a good, that was a, a lad that worked for my friend Santos Shetty, one of his guys, he'd gone and shot at someone who'd been extradited from Portugal, another big sort of gangster guy. Uh, people have had the face slashed, but I went there, I didn't see it. But all, obviously all the jail goes on lockdown and you've got to hide your mobiles if you get mobile. I mean, I'd, I'd done well, I had a couple of mobiles and uh, they had a brilliant hiding place in the last jail. I dug the floor up at the back. We've got this stuff called MCL. So it basically, it's like a two-part plasticine and it hardens. So I made a rectangular lip, if you like. The phone's packed, a couple of batches on a string underneath the floor, down, bit of cement from round wherever, sprinkle it on top, rub the top, away you go. And how like. often did you use the phone? Just once a week on the Sunday <laughs> when it was bang up all day because, like I say, to get it out after you, you lock down and whatnot, like me. you still need an eye on the on the gate, do you know what I mean? You still need an eye on the... But like I say, I was banged up on me on them, but there's too many grasses, mate. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> they'll use your fucking phone and then they'll go and tell the superintendent you've got it. Yeah. So it's very, very, do you know what I mean, up and down, but that Such was the best one. times. When I had the contact, you know, just sat there doing text messages, newspaper there, one eye there, underneath. <laughs> Sort of at the side of me and away I gone. But you know, just having that contact with home, it was it was a it was mega, you know. It was brilliant. Brilliant. So yeah. tell us a little bit about uh, going forward, like because you you fought this case, didn't you? Yeah, so like I say I was considering doing the um transfer agreement because there's a bilateral agreement, you know, with India and uh, <coughs> excuse me, and UK. So we looked into this and it was a minimum of 18 months and I thought, I've done three years, eight months, I cannot do that again. In my mind, it was like, I've already spent three years, eight months, I cannot, I especially can't do it. I knew in my own mind I'd get 10 eventually, it wouldn't be 20. Mm. They'd have to make it concurrent in, a, in the higher court because there's no provision in Indian law to do it consecutive. So it had to be concurrent, mm. but it made it more of a headache for me. So I couldn't transfer because... Basically, if I'd done the transfer agreement then on 20 years mm. and it took me to say five to six years served, I'd still have 14 to do at home. But then you do half of that, as you know, you do 50%. Well, I'd have seven left. So it make no, you know, I wouldn't be benefiting from it. So basically, we, we decided, me and my family, to go to the High Court to fight in the High Court. I was convicted on the, um, the 5th of July 2013, I was convicted. And then I was acquitted by the High Court, thank God, on the 5th of July 2019, exactly six years to the date. But the hardest time was my last three months because the uh, appeal was done. You know, all the arguments from the prosecution and the defence was over. Everything's been reviewed. I was waiting for my judgment and it was from maybe end of March, April. It took three months to tell, to tell me. I was acquitted. Three month, then three month every day. Felt like I'm looking for an answer. Oh, mate, just waiting every day, listening to the Tannoy system, waiting for my name. You know, Barry Hull's Tally Beaster, like get all your pot and your bedding and fuck off. Like that's what I was waiting for every day, and it was really hard, sort of. Horrible, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Just why three months to make a decision to say yes or a no <clears throat> and to fill out your. You know, you sheet it, so whatever else. Unbelievable. Someone's life, it's someone, you know. Yeah. Especially from another country, you know, eight, 10,000 miles or whatever ever it is away. You know, we're not on our doorstep completely. You know, we're not in Europe. It's a no. completely different, you uh, know, yeah. kind of fish, had, mate, as I you know. As you I had know. the same experience when I was coming to a repatriation back to the UK in uh, 2010. Yeah. And I'd been granted the, the repat. But they wouldn't give me a date, right? Yes. Security, they were saying. Right. Right, so they came to me and said, like, yeah, you're going on this day now. Right, fine. I've been yeah, waiting. Yeah, of course, Bags of course. are packed. Can't settle. Right. Next thing, fucking Bangkok is up in flames. Right. It's uh, There's a red and, and yellow party going to war with each other. Oh, yeah. I was burners on the cities. I was there 2009 yeah. when it was going on, it's actually. Yeah. Smoke, right? Sunkran, yeah. Yeah, so you've got a um, fucking... Shumavari fucking what's I can't even remember it's got the, the airport right it's not the new one it was the old one right don't 
done with Wang. So con- oh yeah, yeah. Right, done with Wang. So yeah. convict Road, I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So the done with Wang, I think it was called that. That they've um, that's all the flights are cancelled. Yeah, yeah. So with that cancels, I'm fucking cancels. I'm because getting I'm at the gate. Protests going Bang, on. Bang! I yeah. get sent back, mate. I'm thinking, oh, oh my god, so. I'm never gonna get out of here. It took I another love- week, not a week, not not three months, but another week of like listening for yeah, my name, every day, looking yeah. at the door. But it was just, it was a fucking, it was, it, it, yeah, it's playing games with someone's feelings. It certainly know. is, yeah, because it's like, you, do you know, actually, when I was in them courtrooms, obviously, I didn't know what was going on half the time. They speak a little bit of English, 10, yeah. 20%, mostly Hindi. Didn't know what was going on. I couldn't argue anything. I'm at the back of the courtroom. My lawyer and the prosecution are there. One day, I seen them fucking flicking each other's ears and all that, and I'm thinking, this is my life, mate. You think this is a game? Pulling each other's jackets and all that. Mm. Like it's a fucking game. I felt like getting up and, you know, saying something. But what can you do, mate? You've got to just keep quiet and stomach. It's just another know? day in the fucking and court for them, yeah, isn't it? that's it. So what happened then? So you get, you get acquitted? I got acquitted in the end, yeah. And rightly so, because I want guilt. Eh? No compensation? Um, not a penny, mate. But, you know, we looked into this and it'd take maybe 20, 25 years and I might get a large sum of five grand or something like that wow. for all them years so i mean like you said human life it doesn't mean nothing over there oh, um yeah. you know yeah. the dog's treated better animals are treated better the amount of people that lose limbs on the railways and everything else and the amount of poor people on the street and you know for such a huge big world playing country you know in the top five global countries it's it's the diversity is untrue yeah. there's so many classes it's like seven or eight classes you don't have upper lower middle you, there's so many different you have untouchables they can never do anything in life because they've grown up with that second name yeah. if you're born with that second name you will be a, a slave in the field you know in the farmer's field or a maid or you won't be able to excel in life because no. that's what you are sort of thing and just a different different world so what was it like getting released and, and coming back home Um <clears throat> excuse me what actually happened was the judge which was good for me the lady judge she we was actually waiting for her to, to try and you know we sort of stalled it near the end so she's a good for the um she's for the defense rather than the prosecution she'd give a lot of acquittals basically first of all it was between it was before the division judge because it's more than 10. the division judge just said around september 2018 it needs to be passed to a single judge bench because, you know, there's no provision in the Indian law for this. So why it was given in the first place, I don't know. Maybe it was because of the Raj, because they hate the British for some other reason. I felt that personally, whether it was true, I don't know, from this judge. But how come one man judge your fate, you know? You know, one yeah. man, he might have bias against white people or he might have bias against British people or whatever it could be, but I don't believe that should happen. So... The two uh, High Court judges have passed it down and they've reduced it to 10. They've made it concurrent. So now I'm on 10. But I've already done over nine, you know, so it's a waste of time by then. Anyway, I'm not going to transfer but at this point anyway. Uh, so like I say, we waited till around March. The case finished with the single bench. Uh, the superintendent at the time, it was, it was okay with me. We did this new one. He was pretty good with me. And uh, basically I got the call. I went, he stood up and he had his hand out, he shook his hand, he said, like, you've been acquitted. And it was just a massive relief, mate, you know. Three months, it was like, am I going to be here till November? Because I was arrested November 21st, 2009, so I was going to be there till the same date in, the, you know, the 2019 when I got released. Um, I was hoping to be out for my birthday on May the 2nd. It's obviously, that passed and whatever. And like I said, it come to July the 5th for some bizarre reason. It was exactly the same day, exactly six years to the day wow. from being sentenced to being acquitted. I got that feeling it was just like a relief, but I still went out the woods. Yeah. Um, the judge's order when I read it was, you must be deported within 10 days. Now, there was a bit of to and fro in. Now, this was on a Wednesday I got the acquittal. I was still there on the Friday. Yeah. Now, what's happened was he was supposed to put me in the uh, detention centre and uh, the Mumbai customs were coming, put me in the d- detention, get me on a flight, get me out, whatever. So, um, 
it turns out anyway that it, it goes to the Friday. I've, I've ended up walking in the office and I said, I'm a free man. I said, what, what are you doing holding me here? I said, I'm gonna, if I walk out that door now, like Sabi, call him Sabi. Like, if I walk out that door now, Sabi, is he going to shoot me off the tower of what with a gun? So I said, because I'm, I'm a free man. I said, you're holding me. So he, 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 nice guy, done a few phone calls, basically arranged for one of the guards to come out with me. What we had to do was travel to Mumbai. Uh, like I say, it's a 12-hour journey by road. So this was sort of morning time. I got like £100 what I'd saved up from my monthly allowance, which was £25, £30. So I'd saved that over the years. So I had that to take out with me. We jumped on the back of his motorbike. It was fucking surreal, mate. Honest to God, you know, all that time and not seeing sort of outside. So you're on the back of a bike. And then on the back of a bike, we goes to this little butty stall thing. We had some fried bread or something from the side of there. Gets on a coach. Uh, now, one of my friends, I met a really good guy in the jail uh, from the Philippines. So you'll read about him in the book called Ray. And he really helped me on the outside. He was still stuck there because... He, uh, he got acquitted by session court. The high court had challenged it. He had to stay there another eight, nine years. And then now the Supreme Court have challenged it, the bastard. So he's stuck there with no passport and everything else. So family helped him out, what we could, monetary-wise. Um, he'd send letters over. So instead of me posting him, half of them go missing. I'd go to the court, give him the letters. He'd scan them. They'd have them virtually straight away, you know. So just for that sort of peace of mind for my family as well it was a diamond so he was there all the way so i'd arranged to go and stay with him in mumbai we get to puna gets a shared tax and with this guard he was he's a good lad like he's only a young lad and that gets with him and he's like we'll have a party when we get there and all that i'm like i don't know about a party man i've not touched fucking alcohol for years and gets to raise anyway it's about two in the morning now and uh, he's like right i'll stay i'm gonna stay with you till the monday uh, sorry, till the Saturday morning, rather, the following morning. And then we're going to go to the um, offices and do all the paperwork, basically. We get, say, uh, we have a couple of whiskeys. Obviously, he's he's met an Indian girl while he's been out there. And he's got a kid to our newborn baby. Only little room, as you can imagine. Tiny little room. So he's like, ah, I'm going to start my pals, but don't be getting off with it. I said, listen, mate, do, you, do I look like I want to stay in this fucking country? I want to get my ass out of here. I'm not going to go nowhere. So he arranged to meet me the next day in Mumbai Central, gets on the train with, with uh, Ray, my mate, goes and meets him and goes to the foreign office. It's shut every second Saturday. They shut these government offices. They're proper lazy in India, by the way. So it's shut. So he's like, you're going to have to come back to Kolhapur. I said, are you having a laugh? You're going to get me back on a train or a fucking coach 12 hours back down there to come back on Monday. I went, in a bit, dickhead. So it was all right and... What we done, we had to go to another prison, a woman's prison. We met a two-star officer, sorted everything out. I knew him from a different jail, and he said, right, meet me on the Monday. So basically, on the Monday, I went and met him then. And then, I won't go into too much detail, because it's all in the book, and I don't want to spoil it we'll for your listeners. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to spoil it for your listeners, but I had a big headache, mate, for another week before I got out of there. Yeah, yeah but... So God's that's, case of that's all in this. It certainly is, my mate, yeah. So tell us a little bit about, before we finish, on what your life is like today. Well, my life's blessed today because switching that switch there on that light, I feel blessed that I can turn a light off, you know, and go to sleep. When I come home and my mum had run me a big bubble bath, I got in that, mate, and I felt like the luckiest man in the world. You know, I felt like, honest to God, and it's even to this day that I can sit on a toilet you know, that I can mm. sit down. I might spend an extra five minutes now because I can. You know, I'm not uh, in my legs squatting. And just the tiny things in life, Billy, are really, you, you appreciate them a lot more. Family. Yeah. You know, I've had three grandkids while I was away. Obviously, you lose people as well as people being born. And, you know, but I don't have no regrets because it's a university of life. And I think it's made me a better person, a stronger person. Opens your eyes into a lot more. I'm sure you'll agree. It's like you really appreciate what time you've got because you never know what's around the corner. Brilliant. And with that, you don't know. We're going to finish on the pale of wisdom that I always ask everybody. Okay. So, what would you say to a young Barry Ulsh walking through the doors of life? If you had an opportunity to speak to yourself, what guidance would you offer yourself? I'd say basically, don't be naive and don't think certain countries are banana republics because I thought that was a banana republic. And I tell you what. 
their technology is as good as ours and there is a you know their gdp is better than ours they're a bigger country than us but you go to go and you see the little side of things and you don't expect it's going to be so bad you know also it's naive don't trust people i mean i can trust on that and two people i've got two very very close friends now also as you know yourself you find out your true friends you try and you find out the bullshitters mm. and you're always going to get them like you come home they're up your ass or take you for this that, and the other but they never wrote you a letter they never visited your mum or you know asked out you know but then you know the script mate so i think the advice they offer is just be careful when you go in other countries basically because yeah. you don't know what they, and especially these bent countries where they can set you up yeah definitely yeah and with that, Barry, thanks for coming on, mate. Brilliant. I'll put all the links within the description. So if you're interested in buying this book, you'll find it in the description. And thank you, Barry, for coming on. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, mate.